HTP Co. And joining me for our session on sustainability is Amelia DeLuca, the Managing Director of Sustainability at Delta Airlines. Hi, Amelia, how are you? Hi, Vince, thank you for having me here today. No, thank you for joining me. This is uh, really exciting stuff. So I, before we get into it, I was uh, wondering if you could just give us a minute to, to provide an overview, a you know, background on yourself. Certainly. Well, it's absolutely, as I mentioned, a pleasure to be here. I am an airline veteran. This is the only thing I've ever done. I joined Northwest Airlines right out of college and I've never looked back. I've moved through the Delta's commercial organization over a 15 year career. And when Delta offered me this incredible opportunity to move into sustainability and shape the work that we're doing, um, I just couldn't resist it. It's a passion of mine personally, and to be able to combine that personal passion with professional work is uh, it's a dream come true. So excited Vince, to have this dialogue and to share a little bit about what Delta is doing as well as the entire airline industry is doing. Well, great, thank you. I can see why you're excited about your role. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, so Delta's established a leadership position in airline sustainability. Uh, last year, uh, Delta made a $1 billion commitment to become the uh, first carbon neutral airline and proclaim that carbon neutrality is here. Yeah, how did you set out to achieve this and uh, what are the critical components of, of your strategy? So what we did when we made that decision was acknowledge the fact that our consumers today, our travelers are facing a conflict and we want to take that conflict away from them. And that, that conflict is, and especially the younger generation that is starting to travel more and more, whether it's for business or for leisure, that they want to be part of helping to save the planet, that they want to be part of the solution when it comes to climate change, but that they also love travel and not just in a superficial way, but travel is what connects people to places and people to people and people to opportunities. I mean, I don't need to tell anyone here that, you know, travel is more than just travel, right? It's what society is built on. And in fact, the only way we're actually going to address climate change is if we indeed can travel and be together to be able to innovate and have, um, you know, real life conversations, because these are really, really big problems. And so carbon neutrality allows Delta the opportunity to take action now. It's really important to make those long-term commitments. It's really important. We saw this week, IATA came out with a commitment to net zero at 2050. Um, a number of airlines, Delta included, have science-based targets, which means in 2035, all those airlines and probably the majority of us will, will adhere to that. It says that our sector will align to the Paris Agreement. And those are really important milestones as we combat climate change. But there's a tool available today. And carbon neutrality just essentially means I take responsibility for my emissions today. We are gonna to continue to emit, of course, we're an industry that is you know, driven by jet fuel. 98% of our carbon footprint comes from jet fuel, but there's also tools available today. You've got things in our control, you've got fleet renewals, operational efficiencies, and of course the scaling of biofuel. But then there's also a real world problem in deforestation. And deforestation actually leads to more greenhouse gas emissions, five times more than the airline industry. And so carbon neutrality, again, is an acknowledgement that there is a tool available today in the form of carbon offsets to help prevent deforestation and to neutralize the emissions that we're causing. And so for us, we're so proud of being able to go back to our consumers now and say, you don't have to choose between seeing and saving the world, that at Delta, we've got your back and we will continue to be committed to carbon neutrality. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the one follow up for you, a, a question on that was related to the balancing of you know your investments in sustainable uh, initiatives uh, relative to the profit motives that you know delta has as an investor owned uh, publicly traded company how, how do you how do you balance those those competing priorities i think in the past that was a really hard discussion for corporations to have because it was always this conflict of investing in sustainability which does come with the price tag. We all see that in our day-to-day -day lives, right? We make those trade-offs in our day-to-day -day lives. Do I wanna pay more for this brand of shoe or this brand of clothing or you know, an extra recycling system so that I can recycle my, you know, my bottles? I mean, we're all making those trade-offs day by day. And so I think corporations at the beginning, especially in the airline industry, where we know, you know profitability is typically razor thin and something that we watch closely, those are hard conversations. But the acceleration of sustainability and, and more broadly ESG in the last 18 to 24 months, especially from investors, puts at the forefront the risk of not prioritizing sustainability from an investor standpoint. I'll come back to consumers. 
And from an investor standpoint, it just means essentially that, you know, there are real world costs that will come for companies that cannot transition. And we don't have to look too much farther than the oil and gas industry to see where some of those problems are coming in, where they're getting told what they need to do, or they're losing access to capital. And so I think part of it is kind of anticipating what the future costs may be if we don't deal with it now, essentially. And then from a consumer perspective, it's pretty straightforward. This is the number one issue for them. We polled a number of our SkyMiles members just a couple months ago and said, here's a whole host of different things that the airlines participate in and trying to do good in the world. What is the number one issue to you? And resoundingly, it's sustainability. And they want, and it's probably no surprise here, they don't want to just be responsible for their emissions themselves. They first want governments to play a role, and we'll, we'll come back to that, Vince, I'm sure later, talk about the role of governments. And then they want corporates to play a role before we go to the end consumer and say, actually, you're responsible for this. So again, you're going to have this kind of cycle of you know trust, and, and Delta is a brand that's built on trust and purpose that's going to be built from this carbon neutrality commitment. And so we may not see it at this exact moment, but this is this is a marathon, and we are like not even in the first mile of this. And so over time, you know, it's definitely going to build Delta up as a brand, which is really important to us. Good, good. Yeah, we, we do touch on investors, government, and uh, consumers as we walk through this. But before we get there, I did want to, want to step back with respect to, the, you know, what you think is the, the, the biggest driver or drivers pushing Delta to take such a, a leading position in, in sustainability. Uh, is it coming from corporate leadership, uh, from government mandates, um, or you mentioned consumer feedback? Or is it with the employees from the ground up? Yeah, how do you how do you see this? Well, I think we always at Delta have always talked about kind of the virtuous circle, I suppose, that it's employees and if employees are happy, they take care of our customers. And if customers are happy, then they take care of our stakeholders and our shareholders. And so I think it's the same cycle here for sustainability. I think it's our employees who are very passionate about this issue. We have a large, what's called a business resource group. It's our largest at Delta is the one that's focused on sustainability. We've got 3000 plus members and growing by the day who are saying, I want to make a difference in my day job. And then that very naturally leads into consumers. Consumers are also very worried about this, as I mentioned, and consumers have always been at the forefront of every decision that Delta has made. And again, you don't have to look much further than the pandemic to see our middle seat block was exactly that. It was a decision to take care of our customers before anything else, our employees and our customers. And that will, of course, lead to benefits with shareholders. But I will say we do engage quite a bit with our shareholders, though. They're a driving force of what we do. Um, many, many of you here with us today probably know the role that Larry Fink plays as the CEO of BlackRock. And so, you know, BlackRock as an investor is essentially saying we're only going to invest in companies that, you know, are playing a leading role in this space. And so we are very much listening to what our investors want right now. Great. And it's really interesting. Okay, good. So you mentioned the pandemic. Um, let's talk about the impact of that on sustainability initiatives with, within the airline industry. We've seen a, a range of reactions uh, from the airlines. In some cases, you know, sustainability efforts have, have had uh, been deprioritized, if you will. Um, it, uh, but at other airlines, such as Delta, it seems like the pandemic has accelerated things. Uh, do you, can you share your views on what, what you, we see uh, transpiring here? Well, I think it's different by region. And I do want to talk more broadly before I get to Delta, because, you know, I'm very humbled to be here today representing Delta. But I also recognize that I am representing my counterparts at all the major airlines, both Delta partner airlines, my U.S. airline counterparts. And what's really cool about sustainability is that it's a space where we can collaborate. You know, normally airlines are the fiercest of competitors. We do not talk to our uh, counterparts in the United States in particular. But when it comes to sustainability, it's actually it all for one and one for all type of a mentality. And so I think what you've seen from the pandemic is not only an increasing urgency from those stakeholders that I just mentioned, you've also seen an increased desire to collaborate in new ways. And that's opening up doors and opportunities and helping speed up some of the work that is coming. And I'll point to a couple of examples of, of areas actually where you'd probably be surprised to know. Of course, Europe, you're seeing a huge acceleration there. Some of that is driven by government mandates that are coming. But the European airlines certainly have just an immense amount of knowledge in this space. They've been working hard at it for a while. So I can say that most of us probably work closely with our Euro European counterparts. But LATAM, of course, which is a partner of Delta's, who's you know been one of those airlines that's been hit so hard during the pandemic and has you know been through bankruptcy and all of that, they have some of the most ambitious waste goals out there. So onboard waste, they're working on getting to onboard waste almost faster than, you know, a number of other airlines that I know. And I think it just shows that acknowledgement that 
although there are some hardships of the pandemic, the ability to still be ambitious, even if it's a little bit further in the future, is, is definitely the time to set those ambitions. Because then as we come out of the pandemic, we will shape our business around those ambitions and those targets. You don't want to wait because then you're going to be too late to set the ambition. And so I think that's where the um, alliance is coming out, you know, not only between, again, Delta and its partners, but all the airlines just saying we've got to do more. We've got to move a little bit faster. And again, I think travel is just so near and dear to all of our hearts that we don't want to end up as one of those industries that didn't make it through this transition. And again, we, we see paths forward and they're emerging um, every single day. And so that's what I think makes that acceleration possible. Okay, great. Uh, you mentioned investors, so let's uh, circle back on, uh, on on that topic and look at this from a capital perspective. Uh, there's a lot of money flowing into environmental, social, and governance uh, investments or ESG funds that invest in companies that meet specific uh, sustainability criteria. Um, one estimate has ESG assets growing to more than $50 trillion by 2025. Now, a company can benefit from this uh, by having access to these investment dollars uh, by lowering their cost of capital. Is this something that's um, given a lot of consideration? And how are you seeing this uh, dynamic play out within the investor community that follows the aviation industry? Well, it's a great timing for that question. We just completed our ESG listening tours where we met with some of our top investors, both in terms of the ownership of Delta, but also those investors that are most active in this space to understand just at a very high level, what it is, how they're grading us, how they're grading airlines, what are they looking for? What is that balance between action now, ambition in the future, as well as transparency and disclosure, disclosure of activities. And so I think we have a really good sense right now of what is driving investors. And I think that's the first step. And then I think right after that comes exactly what you just said, Vince, how do we create win-win situations um, where investors who feel confident in certain corporations are able to help them accelerate the work they do. And that's where you can definitely see those benefits to the cost of capital, you know, for airlines who are going out on a limb and making commitments to ESG type activities. I will say that has not been um, as present in the airline industry as you've seen in other industries. And I think it's probably just the nature of the pandemic more than anything else. We've focused on liquidity in a really different way. But I think it's something that is, you know, coming for our industry and something I know we talk a lot about internally with our finance and our treasury and our, our uh, investor relations teams. And then I think there's the doomsday scenario, which I don't get too caught up in, but I do try to make sure um, that I'm thinking about, which is you see companies that have, you know, had problems with, you know, financing uh, access to capital or um, shareholder proposals. Or you've seen these, you know, kind of activist investors come in and say, I don't think you're doing the right thing or you're not, you know, you're not going fast enough or I want to see more. And then there's huge ramifications. And so I think right now there's a balance between the carrot and the stick. And I think we'll kind of see over time which one, again, gets people to move the fastest. I think it'll always be a mix. Every company is a little bit different in how they engage with investors, the speed at which they're moving, the capital dollars that they're putting behind the activities. Um, but I think, again, that's the investors to me are actually not a scary thing at all. They're one of the most, you know, one of the greatest benefits we have is understanding what our investors want and then trying to work with them to make sure that because of our activities that we're able to benefit either from the cost of capital or just ensuring that we will have capital for the long term. All right. Great. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned um, your outreach to customers earlier, so I want to circle back on, on uh, the customer perspective here. Uh, are you seeing your sustainability efforts have a have an impact on customer acquisition or retention? Uh, and does the message resonate more with specific customer segments, you know, such as millennials who, who may prioritize sustainability efforts higher than other travelers? Yes. So first and foremost, I will just say we have focused, all of us collectively have told our travelers for the last 18 plus months that safety is our number one priority our customer safety, our employees' safety. Um, and that, of course, was driven by the pandemic and the most important thing to do. And that's why you haven't heard from a lot of the airlines probably until kind of late spring this year, even into summer on sustainability. A lot of us kind of held back, say we don't want to distract the message here. If people are traveling right now, they're not worried about their environmental footprint. They're traveling because it's critical travel. And the thing they care about is safety. Will I get there? What happens if my you know test goes wrong? A whole host of issues. So as we emerge from the pandemic, of course, it's setting that baseline about awareness, 
and then what resonates with customers. So in that survey I mentioned earlier, you know, one of the things we found was that there is a general lack of awareness for what carbon neutrality is, just understanding what does that mean? How is that different than net zero? And then with that, we also found that, you know, we are below where we would like to be with consumer awareness of our carbon neutrality commitment, which ties really well to our marketing campaign that just launched last month that you will see run through the end of the year. It's got a beautiful commercial. Um, it's got a lot of activation on our website as well as third party sites, just talking about this concept of carbon neutrality and not choosing between seeing the world and saving the world. And so for us, our number one thing right now is to get that message out that Delta is carbon neutral and you should care that we are carbon neutral because that's a very big commitment and it's making an impact immediately. The other thing we saw in that survey though, that guides our plans going forward, no surprise, Consumers are really attracted to understanding what an airline is doing from its fleet perspective. I think that resonates because people understand about cars, right? I purchase a more fuel efficient car. I purchase an electric car. And they're kind of, I think, wondering slash it feeling very connected to an airline who's talking about its fleet strategy, which again is something airlines have always done, but you're gonna see that I think accelerated in how we put our fleet front and center in terms of sustainability. Then you've got sustainable aviation fuel, which consumers are starting to become aware of and I think over time, at least what we're seeing in Europe is consumers actually participate in purchasing sustainable aviation fuel for their individual travel. Today in the US, we mostly see that through the corporations who are purchasing sustainable aviation fuel in order to address their own business travel emissions. But I think over time, you're gonna see that come into consumers. And then in terms of the groupings, um, what I mentioned earlier is actually really interesting by age grouping. And I think it surprises people a little bit. So. Um, that concept of government is the one first responsible for someone's travel emissions, then business, then individual. I asked a group of people yesterday, I said, what do you think that looks like for the younger generation? And they said, well, no, they, they probably feel like they are more responsible for their emissions at an individual level. And I said, no, actually not. Because the generation that's coming behind us, while it's so passionate about sustainability, are also kind of fed up and saying, I have inherited a problem and I shouldn't be the sole person responsible for this. And so... What you're actually finding is with our younger generation, not even millennials, Gen Zs at this point, you're finding that companies that take responsibility for their business travel footprint as a foundation and then offer ways for them to engage, that's actually the perfect match. That it doesn't work if we just pass things on to them. It has to be a you know almost a one for one. Company does this and then they give me the opportunity to also do this so it's a feel good, Plus, it shows that the company is taking responsibility. So again, that's very aligned with our carbon neutral commitment. Great. Yeah, you um, you mentioned uh, the commercial uh, you launched last month. That uh, I did get a chance to, to see it. It uh, I would encourage everyone who hasn't to go check it out. So, good stuff. All right. So we talked about um, uh, customers. Uh, you'd mentioned regulations. So let's let's move on to governments. Um, so you know, if you look at governments around the world, they're at various stages of regulation related to same, uh, sustainability. Uh, I read recently that the you know here in the U.S., the SEC is actually moving forward with a requirement for public companies to disclose more information about how how they're responding to climate change. Um, so where do you see the most significant progress? And where are we lagging behind? And is it fair to say that many airlines uh, like Delta just aren't waiting for government uh, regulation and uh, in order to move forward with uh, sustainability efforts? Well, I can say unequivocally at the very top that I, I am so impressed with the airline industry's speed of refocusing and amplifying our efforts on sustainability, whether it's when I meet with my you know partners under Sky Team. Um, or again, my US counterparts, I think everyone is saying, how do we get out in front of this? How do we anticipate what's coming from government so that we can be in charge of our destiny? And I know there's a number of viewers who are probably on here are connected into Europe. And so just to kind of break down what you're seeing in the world in terms of how governments are getting involved in this. So the, you know, the most simple kind of way to think about it is Europe is going down a path of mandates, which essentially says that they're going to say, for example, starting next year in France, all fuel producers must produce 1% of their fuel or their jet, you know, their jet fuel must be produced with sustainable aviation fuel. That's a mandate. You're starting to see some additional mandates on what, you know, beyond just this, um, this sector, but, you know, carbon pricing, carbon taxing. Um, those are the sorts of things that we call mandates just because of the fact that it's not really an incentive. It's just kind of like if you emit carbon or if you do this, you will either pay for that carbon or you will pay a penalty if you do not address your, your footprint in the way that we'd like you to. Interesting model. I think we'll see how it plays out. I, I feel very um, 
lucky to have so many European airline partners as part of my life because I think they're keeping us up to speed on what that looks like. And then you move into the US and we always talk about the concept of incentives. Incentives is what we're focused on in the US right now. The Biden administration has actually been wonderfully supportive of that in the bills that are being reconciled right now is a uh, blenders tax credit, which is an incentive for sustainable aviation fuel producers to help acknowledge the fact that sustainable aviation fuel is pretty much the only solution that is here today to start to bring our carbon footprint down, but at a cost that's three to five times as high as jet fuel, you're not going to have the right demand. And if you don't have the right demand from airlines and customers, and you're not going to have the right supply. And so an incentive like this, allows those producers to be able, as, which I would just mention sustainable aviation fuel producers are typically startups. So capital matters to them right now and future demand matters to them right now. And so the blender's tax credit or that incentive is essentially going to allow them to be able to get up and running in a way that gives them confidence that there will be um, a desire for their product when they're finally able to produce. And many of them are coming online in 2024, 2025. So it's really exciting with large amounts of volume, actually. We've got four producers lined up in the 2024, 2025 period. Um, and all of them, you know, are, we're all banking on those incentives being there. And so it will be very challenging if that if that doesn't come to fruition. And then you mentioned the SEC. Um, the SEC, for those that do not know, went out in the spring and essentially indicated that they were going to increase um, requests for how companies disclose their climate work, their climate footprint, their carbon footprint today, their greenhouse gas footprint as well as the activities that they're doing behind it. And the desire there, of course, from the SEC's perspective is to make sure there isn't greenwashing and to make sure that investors know the companies that they are investing in, what they're actually doing. Because it's very hard today. We always joke sustainability is generally the wild, wild west and reporting on sustainability is just as much the wild, wild west. And so we personally, Delta, as well as under our trade association, A4A, sent in letters of support for that activity within the SEC. We want standardized reporting. We want reporting that gives people confidence in what we're doing. In the meantime, we have gone ahead and, you know, we Delta and again, many of my many of my counterparts here, we have ESG reports or annual corporate responsibility reports where, you know, they're long and everyone doesn't love that they're 80 pages, but there is a lot of information in there that says this is what we emit. This is how we emit it. Let's talk about, you know, not just jet fuel, but talk about our ground support equipment. Let's talk about waste that comes off the airplane. So it's setting out there and saying, this is what we're doing. So that's a really important part of disclosure. And then it sets the ambition as well as tracks the progress. So things that have been in there for a long time for us is fuel efficiency annually, because fuel efficiency is directly tied to our carbon intensity as a company. And so we personally welcome the work that the SEC is doing. We're actually anticipating it. And I know another airlines, a number of airlines are also. Um, you know, Our trade associations do a lot of work preparing us. There's these different standards that are out there that I think we're expecting the SEC to likely take these kind of standards and say, this is what all companies must use going forward. One is TCFD. And the only reason I mention that is that's a pretty, it's a pretty cool model. It's very comprehensive, but it forces every company to say, here are my risks when it comes to climate. And here's the potential financial impact. And what are the physical risks? So if I have an airport located in a certain location that may have you know, extensive flooding in the future. It's calling out those risks so that we can be transparent with investors so that they can, again, make the most informed decisions on how to support. And so it's an exciting time from a government perspective. I think we'll see what plays out. You know, we've got mandates, incentives, and then just a general focus on disclosure. Um, I think all are welcome right now, but especially at least from a Delta perspective, very focused on the incentives and very focused on the standardization of disclosure. Okay, great. Uh, you'd mentioned, um, uh, and, and uh, you know, sustainable uh, alternative fuels and, and uh, waste reduction. And when people talk about airline sus sustainability, they tend to focus on emissions and alternative fuels. But but waste reduction is is a crucial part of of the equation. Uh, can you describe Delta's work on uh, waste recycling and the the impact of of the efforts there? Well, it's it's it is really interesting, Vince. To your point that you know the biggest impact we make on the planet as i mentioned is jet fuel 98 percent of our carbon footprint but what consumers see is not jet fuel consumers get on an airplane and they see waste and they see plastic water bottles and plastic cups um, and they see food and they see products and they wonder how those products are sourced and so for us right now when it comes to waste recycling and just generally the products that we carry on board we're really stepping back and thinking about, okay, what's our ambition? How are we gonna get there? So our vision is zero impact aviation. 
which just means we're not only addressing our carbon footprint, but we're addressing the waste that comes off of our airplanes. We also have an opportunity with every product that we procure on board to make sure we're, we are partnering with socially sustainable vendors, vendors that are either local companies, small businesses, um, or just have, you know, absolutely wonderful kind of a wonderful story to tell about how the products are created. And so, um, you know, I would say some of that you're going to see soon. Obviously, during the pandemic, plastic bags were the name of the game because we had to make sure that everything was clean. Um, but you've seen those start to move away from those. And we've been able to move back into, you know, what is our kind of core when it comes to this. So Delta was one of the first airlines to recycle passenger aluminum cans, plastic cups and bottles, newspapers and magazines. Um, since 2007, we've recycled more than 3 million pounds of aluminum on board. And you actually get a rebate from that, which is really cool. So we fully funded 12 Habitat for Humanity homes from that uh, aluminum on board. Uh, of course, during the pandemic, one of the things we accelerated was that we removed Sky Magazine. And I do hear mixed reviews about that. Certain people love Sky Magazine, but Sky Magazine, of course, had, you know, it was 4 million pounds of printed paper annually. And that also has weight, which means that it causes more fuel which is something that's really interesting just in general about onboard sourcing of products is just an acknowledgement that while you might have a product that feels like take the plastic cup for example you want to move to an aluminum product or an aluminum cup those can weigh more which means you actually burn more fuel and so that's the kind of thing we talk about all the time in sustainability is what is our ambition try to find that north star and then try to make sure we just take incremental steps in everything that we do because we haven't got it fully right yet but we know what we need to do and just at a very high level what that means is essentially we've got to be on top of our waste and our single use plastics and we've got to accelerate the work and you're going to see more from Delta as we move into next year on both of those. Okay. Well, we only have a, a few minutes left. So I guess let me wrap up with this question for you. Uh, what could all of us do to make uh, air travel more sustainable? You know, the adoption of sustainable initiatives uh, make that happen at a much quicker pace. So first and foremost, I think we need to get the message out about what the industry is doing. And so no matter where you are in the world today, and no matter what your job function is, I am confident you are dealing with consumers, you are dealing with investors, you are dealing with media, and we all have to be aligned in telling the story that this industry matters to the world and that it cannot not exist in the future, that we will solve this problem together. And I am just so optimistic about that. Although again, we are a hard to decarbonize sector. It just means for us, there's no easy solution and it is gonna be pretty dang close to 2050 until we get to net zero. But we have a plan, we have tools available today. We have ways in which we can collaborate today, like things I mentioned on sustainable aviation fuel is a great way for many of us to come together and say we need either government help, we can come up with corporate and customer programs. Um, and then I think that one of the best things that we can do is also just, again, respect the tools that are out there. Carbon offsets are always a mixed bag on how people feel about those, but those are a viable option today that can make a difference in our fight against climate change. And so I think first off is getting the message out and respecting what this industry is doing. And then I think just finding your connection to it at a very personal level, because this is hard work. It's really daunting. Everyone that is on here today, I am certain you are starting to feel it more and more. Sustainability is creeping into your day job, no matter what your day job is. It's starting to creep into your day job. And for those of us that are kind of in it every day, it feels scary, feels very overwhelming. And so what I, what, what you know, climate scientists say to do, who sometimes also are faced with this thing of like, what do I do? There's so much here. I don't know where to get started. What can I do? Climate scientists recently did a survey and the main thing that came out was just do something, even if it's little. So whether that's within your company, within your personal life, just do something that makes you feel like you are having an incremental um, value add. And so I've got a member of my team, just a little thing to say, every month she takes a new sustainability activity and integrates into, into her life. No more plastic bags, um, you know, no more products that were sourced in this way, right? Whatever your journey is, personal or professional, I think just know that take those little steps forward and don't give up because it's gonna take all of us, but I'm super confident that this industry is gonna be able to weather this challenge. All right, fantastic. So unfortunately, that takes us to the end of our time here. Really enjoyed the conversation. I, I um, really appreciate you, you sp spending some time with us to talk about you know, a passion of yours, not only the professional journey of yours, but your passion as well. So thanks very much, Amelia. Thank you, Vince, for having me. And thank you all for tuning in. All right, take care.